Okay, hello class. This is a, a video prepared for Philosophy 103, Introduction to the Art of Thinking. So let's, um, let me just review some of the things we've been doing. And I, what I'd like to do in this lecture is provide a transition for you from critical thinking to inventive thinking. Remember, at the beginning of the course, I told you that there's two basic modes of thinking in logic. One is called critical thinking, and the other is called inventive thinking. Logicians are concerned about critical thinking. What critical thinking is, is when someone makes a judgment about someone else's argument. So that's all logicians do. Remember the definition of logic. Logic is the study of the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning. So we're thinking about the reasoning process. The truth or falsity of the propositions is another claim. If in deductive reasoning, which we've been focusing on so far, if the argument, if the reasoning is correct, then that's called valid. If the reasoning is incorrect, it's called invalid. If the propositions are all true, the premises, that is the support for the conclusion, are true, and the conclusion is true. And what is truth? Well, for logicians, it has to do with correspondence with reality. So if a proposition corresponds to reality, it's true. That opens up a whole philosophical notion of truth, but for now, that's good enough. If the propositions are all true, that is the premises and the conclusions are true, then the argument is called valid. That's deductive reasoning. If the propositions are all true, that is the premises and the conclusion are true, and it's valid, that's called sound. That's the best thing you can say about an argument. So that's all called critical thinking. You're making a judgment about someone else's arguments, whether it's in the written word or the spoken word. And the process that logicians go through and what we've been studying is to translate passages from natural language or what logicians call ordinary language and translate that into standard form categorical syllogisms if it's possible. Once you can translate them into standard form then you can test their validity and we we studied three different methods of testing the validity. The best one is called the Venn diagram technique and that's the one we worked on so hard in this class and it takes some practice. There are only 15 valid syllogisms. We'll work on those. We'll think about those today. The other mode of thinking that I mentioned is what I call inventive thinking. Now I've come up with a way of taking the tools for critical thinking, nam namely the tools, the, the tools of logic the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning. I found a way to take those and transform those into tools to, co to construct arguments. That allows us to use logic as a building tools, a, 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 a group of building tools to construct arguments, to actually invent arguments. And in life, especially if in you're in any kind of leadership position, you're gonna be asked to not only make judgments about other people's arguments, but to actually construct arguments, to invent arguments. That taps into the creative part of the mind. So now I wanna, this video, I want to uh, show you a way and tell you how I came up with this, of taking these principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning, that is the tools of logic, uh, the, the principles and methods of logic, which are typically used to make judgments about arguments, namely critical thinking, turn those into tools for constructing arguments. <clears throat> so we, we studied three different methods of determining the validity of deductive arguments. One was the Venn diagram technique, and we worked hard on that. The other are those six rules. If the syllogism doesn't break any rule, then it's valid. If it does break a rule, then each 
transgression of the rule has a name, a fallacy, and, it, and it's invalid because it broke that rule and commits that fallacy. So we worked hard on that. The third method is called the coined name method. And what that is, is it's simply 15 names that monks from the Middle Ages came up with in Latin, the vowels of which name the mood and figure of the 15 valid syllogisms. So they just memorize these 15 names in a particular order. And if the syllogism matched that name, namely the vowels of that name, then it was valid. So it doesn't tell you much. It's just a mnemonic device to indicate which syllogisms are valid. So we talked about um, mood and figure of syllogisms. But before that, we, we talked about the quality and quantity of propositions. Now, log logicians talk about two qualities and two quantities. Propositions, be they pre uh, premises or conclusions, they're either universal or they're particular. So universal means all or no or none. <clears throat> and there's only two quant there's only two qualities, affirmative or negative. So if there's only two qualities and only two quantities, then propositions all take the form of all S is P, where S represents the subject, P represents the predicate of a proposition. All humans are mortal, for example. Humans is the subject, mortal is beings who are mortal is the predicate. So that's called an A proposition from the word affirmo in Latin. They just took the letter A. If it's affirmative and it's universal, it's an A proposition. We studied that. If it's universal and negative, it's called an E proposition, capital E. E proposition from the word nego. They took the E from the Latin I negate. It's universal. I say no SSP. No human is capable of walking through uh, a tree. So the subject of that proposition is human being and those beings who are capable of walking through trees, then that's the predicate. That turns into no SSP. I told you the brilliance of Aristotle who invented this whole deductive and inductive reasoning was to look at the form of thinking and bracket the content. So instead of saying no human can walk through trees, you can just say no SSP. That's called an E proposition. We studied that. <clears throat> if the proposition is affirmative but particular, like it turns into some SSP. Remember, there are only two quantities, universal and particular, only two qualities, affirmative and negative. So if it's universal, uh, if it's particular and affirmative, that's called an I proposition from. The word affirmo in Latin, they took the I, so it turns into some S is P. Some humans are intelligent, for example, where S, the subject is humans, and P is intelligent beings. And then the other, the last one is called an O proposition. Some S is not P. It's particular and it's negative. It's called an O. From the word nego, they just took the O. So we have A. E, I, and O. And we learned that only A and E propositions have, uh, only I and O propositions have existential import. What that means is, from a logical point of view, we're positing the existence of entities only with particular propositions. With universal propositions, we're not positing the existence of any entities. If I say no S is P, it just means if there are any S's, they're not going to be P's. If I say all S's P, it means if there are any um, S's, they are P's. So that's just a philosophical point that logicians have come up with. So we have, <clears throat> in the syllogisms, we've learned that there are two premises and a conclusion. 
a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion when they're in standard form. And there's only three terms, subject term, predicate term, and a middle term. And we learned from chapter seven of the logic book how to translate arguments from ordinary language into standard form. That was a whole chapter and it was complicated and we went through all that. Once you get it into standard form, how do we get it into standard form? Well, the first step is to find the conclusion of an argument. Then you find the predicate term of the conclusion. Whatever other proposition contains the predicate term of the conclusion, that becomes your major premise. Then you look for the subject term of the conclusion. Whatever proposition contains the subject term of the conclusion, that's your minor term, your minor premise. And there's only one other term. That's the middle term. So the middle term exists only once in the major premise, which comes first, and it exists only once in the minor premise and never exists in the conclusion. The predicate term is always in the, so the, the major premise is gonna have a middle term and a predicate of the conclusion. The minor premise is gonna have a middle term and the subject term of the conclusion. And then the conclusion is a subject and predicate. Now those propositions, the, the two premises and the conclusion, <clears throat> um, take the form of A, E, I, or O propositions. So you just name the major term, whether it be an A, E, I, or O, uh, the major premise, then the minor premise, you name it, is it an A, an E, an I, or an O, and then the conclusion, is it an A, E, I, or O. You list those three together. Let's say they're all A's. All M is P, all S is M, therefore all S is P, let's say. That's called an AAA syllogism. That names the mood of the syllogism. They can be any combination. So now there's also the figure of the syllogism. This is also something we've talked about. But I, I just want to review this for you so the transition makes more, more sense to you. The transition from critical thinking to inventive thinking. That's the last part of this course, the part that I came up with. So the figure of a syllogism has to do with the positioning of the middle term. There's only four ways the middle term, remember the middle terms, there's only one middle term. It exists in the major premise, which comes first, in the minor premise, and then in, it doesn't in, ever come into the conclusion. So the middle term, it can be first in the major premise or it can be second. It can be first in the minor premise and it can be, or it can be second. So there are four different ways. And if you memorize this, you've probably done this already. Uh, let's see if we can see this. So do you see there are four figures? Figure one, first figure. Do you see how the middle terms are? It makes like the beginning of a W. If the middle terms are on the inside, see the second figure? Then it's figure two. If the middle term is in the third, if on the other side, it's figure three. If it's like that, it's figure four. So there are four figures. So, if you test all the possibilities, there are only 15 valid syllogisms. There's like 400, uh, there's a finite number, I'm not sure how many, over 400 invalid syllogisms. And how do we test it? The Venn diagrams and the rules. So, what are these 15 valid syllogisms? Well, what I asked you to do in your last assignment is to actually memorize these 15. The reason I want you to memorize those is because I've learned through experience in my life that if you have certain things in your memory, and not just in your memory, but 
immediate recall, like from playing music, like if I know where a chord is on the guitar, or when I'm handling dogs and doing a maneuver in dog agility, if I know what a front cross is and I have that, and I know the steps and I know how to do that, then I can pay attention to the execution of that maneuver. So the more you have in your memory, the more, and how, and how immediate that is in your memory, the more facility you have in executing that. So that's why I wanted you to memorize that, not just for the sake of memorization. So if you memorize these 15 syllogisms, um, and they're, they're a mnemonic, so the, the 15 are on page 238. I asked you to get a blank sheet of paper and learn how to, and when you can come up with, that's on page 238. So there's like Barbara, for example, the first one. It's an A, A. There are four that belong to the first figure, four that belong to the second figure, four that belong to the third figure, and three that belong to the fourth figure. That's 15. So Barbara has B-A-R-A-R-A, -R -A, has three A's. There are, so you just have to memorize what four names belong to the first figure. So Barbara, Kalarant, Darii, and Ferio. If you just memorize those names, you can take the, um, the vowels of those names and those became, become the moods of figure one. So the first one is an AAA1. If you can just memorize that without the, the name Barbara, that's even better. But the mnemonic device sometimes helps. AAA1, it's always valid. The mood is AAA. What is an AAA1? All M is P. All S is M, therefore all S is P. It's an AAA, -A, and because of the positioning of the middle term, like the beginning of a W, since it's positioned that way, then it's figure one. And then there are figure two, chemistries. Cesare, Morocco, Festio, Festino, um, then AEE2, EAE2, AOO2, and EIO2. Those are all valid. And then there's no reason to go over the rest. They're all on page 238. I hope you can memorize those. You can memorize those 15. Then you'll have in your memory these 15 valid syllogisms. Now, what's the utility of that? Okay, let me share with you <clears throat> how I came up with this transition from critical thinking to inventive thinking, how to take the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning, that's logic, and transform them into tools for constructing arguments, that's called inventive thinking actually constructing it. If you think about it, someone has to make an argument before anybody can make a judgment about that argument, right? All the examples in the logic book, logicians don't come up with that. People who have inventive minds come up with that. Then logicians teach you how to judge whether they're valid or invalid. So we have these 15, all right, so one time in class, <clears throat> I saw on a bumper sticker, music makes you smarter. So I, I thought, that's, that sounds true. I did a little research and I found there's empirical evidence for that. They call it the Mozart effect and they've shown there's all kinds of research being done that something happens to your brain that's good when you practice music. So that, that turns into an A proposition. All practice of music makes a person smarter. Remember when we, study chapter seven, sometimes there's only one thing that constitutes a whole class. So in this case, music. So that turn, if I say music makes you smarter, that's a conclusion. And it turns into an A proposition, all S is P, where S means music, P means activities that make someone smarter. So now you have your conclusion. You have an A proposition, that's a conclusion. Well, all you need to do is go through the list. Actually, there's only one 
of the 15 valid syllogisms that ends in A. The, la the last letter is the conclusion, like an AAA1. The last letter is the conclusion, right? Because the first letter represents the, um, <clears throat> the quality and quantity of, of the major premise. The second letter is the quality and quantity of the minor premise. And then the third letter represents the quality and quantity of the conclusion. So you go through your list in your mind. You don't have to look at anything. You know, an AAA1 is valid. It's, and it's called Barbara, A-A-A, the three A's from the word Barbara. And you know it's figure one because it belongs to figure one. You memorize those in order. There are four for figure one. You memorize those, then you know these are all figure one. So A-A-A-1 is valid. So now it dawned, <clears throat> it dawned on me in class as I was teaching, if you have the conclusion, all S is P. And you know the mood and figure of a valid syllogism. And you know the conclusion ends in an A proposition. Then you have the, the predicate term of the conclusion. It's going to exist in the major premise. And remember, I told you. And, and then the subject term of the conclusion is going to exist in the minor premise. And you know where the you know the positioning of the middle term. So then you know the positioning of the major and minor premise. So if you know, if you say all, if you say music makes you smarter, you can you can generate everything except for the middle term of a valid argument. By going through the list in your mind, finding one that ends in A, which is only one of the 15, A A A1. And you come up with this, all something, that's the middle term, all M, we don't know what that is yet because we're constructing the argument. All M is P. Well, we know P means activities that make you smarter. So that's gonna be our major premise. All something, we don't know what that is yet. All something is an activity that makes you smarter. And you know the form of the minor premise because we know the subject term of the conclusion. And we know that the subject term has to exist in the minor premise. So, and you know the positioning of the middle term because of the figure. So you know that the minor premise is gonna take the form of all music is, and we don't know what that M is, all music, because that's the subject term of music makes you smarter. All music is, and M, we don't know what M is, this middle term. So now you have everything except for the middle term. All M is an activity that makes you smarter. All music is M. Therefore, music makes you smarter. You got everything but the middle term. Now here's where the creative part comes in, your ingenuity. See, in order to go from the premises to the conclusion, you have to see the similarity between these two terms. That's ingenuity, the ability to see similarities in disparate things. One of these days I want to write an essay on that to show at the heart of deductive reasoning is ingenuity. You know, that's worth developing idea, I think, because it shows that the imagination is at the heart of constructing arguments, at the heart of deductive reasoning. The most rigorous form of reasoning is ingenuity and imagination. Imagination to be able to conjure images that see similarities in difference. But that's a philosophical point. Let's get back to the procedure. So if I say music makes you smarter, and I know that an AAA1 syllogism is valid, I have everything but the middle term. I have all something, whatever that middle term is, is an activity that makes you smarter. All music is this something. Therefore, all music makes you smarter. The practice of music makes you smarter. So what is this middle term? Well, this may take time to come up with that. In class, there were some nurses there who were just taking courses in neural uh, physiology. One young nurse raised her hand, nursing major raised her hand. She said, we just learned in biology class 
that anything that stimulates the corpus callosum makes you smarter. Well, boom, there it is. There's our middle term. Whatever stim stimulates the corpus callosum, that part of the brain, it makes you smarter. Whatever activity stimulates that. There was our epiphany, my epiphany, and but it went beyond that because I realized once you know the form of a valid syllogism and you have your conclusion, you have everything but the middle term. So you just need to use your ingenuity and try to find some way the subject and predicate term are related to each other, the similarity there, and you can generate your middle term. So now you have your valid syllogism. And all things that stimulate the corpus callosum make you smarter, major premise. The, the major, the middle term is whatever stimulates the corpus callosum. All S is, all M is P. And then you have your minor premise. Music stimulates the corpus callosum. Therefore, music makes you smarter. So you have your AAA1 and you've just generated an argument. So this process is called instantiation. It's a fancy word, but I have no other way of expressing that idea. So we just think inst instantiation. That you're instantiating, you're moving in the opposite direction of logic. Logicians go from ordinary or natural language into standard form. And then from that position, they can judge the argument, whether it's valid or not. What we're doing is going in the opposite direction. We're going from valid form and instantiating and generating arguments. Okay, so now you have a method for transforming valid form into concrete arguments. Now, of course, if when you're presenting this to the public, in your written in the written form or in spoken language or even in your thinking you don't want to actually speak this way you sound like an automaton you sound like a cyborg and you're going to turn everybody off so what you need to do is translate that argument into eloquent prose and for that you use cha chapter 7 and invert chapter 7 what was chapter 7 it had to do with how to take an arc a uh, passage from ordinary language, translate into a uh, standard form, and then that way it's in position, you're in a position now to judge whether it's valid or not using the Venn diagrams or the rules. We're going in the opposite direction now. So you can still use those techniques, but instead of taking, like for example, um, one technique was you can look for synonyms because valid Standard form syllogisms have only three terms, but when people speak, they use more than three terms. So you can look for synonyms. Like if I say no one is above the law, that's the same as saying no one, no person can do whatever they want. Those are synonyms. So you can collapse synonyms. Well, if you're moving in the opposite direction, then you can generate synonyms. Instead of saying the same thing over and over again, you can use synonyms. So all those techniques you learned from chapter seven, you can use. We'll go over that. I think that might take a lecture itself, how to in invert chapter seven. And not only can we do this with syllogisms, we can do this with symbolic logic too. That's another, uh, I think that's enough for, uh, let's not go into that now, but it's a similar process. If you have a valid elementary form in symbolic logic, if you know, if, if p if uh, p then s and you know p then you know if if you if you know if p then q where p is the antecedent and q is the conclusion and then somewhere in your thinking you substantiate you you show P is actually the case, whatever P could be. These are propositions. Then you could act, you could argue for Q. If P then Q, P, therefore Q. That's called modus ponens. That's from symbolic logic. 
Well, you could instantiate that too, and you have your argument. But we'll we'll approach that in another talk. For now, I just wanted you to learn how you can take these 15 valid syllogisms. So what's the process again? Let me outline it in more um, succinct terms. First thing to do, come first thing to do is come up with a thesis. If you're gonna give a speech on something, you need a thesis. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to be thinking about some controversial issue in your major or something that matters to you. And there are enough controversial issues these days. You know, and just take a side. You don't have to lock yourself into that for the rest of your life. Just take a side for the sake of argument now, where you feel strongly about something. That'll be your thesis. Try to make it in one sentence. Okay, be thinking about that, because that's going to be helpful for your final project. Then I'm going to ask you to generate three syllogisms that support that thesis. Like, let's say, with regard to my uh, syllogism about music making you smarter, let's say you wanted to um, give a, a talk about the importance of the arts in the education of, in, in middle school and in, in schools, because the arts are the first thing to go whenever there's a financial crunch. And what you're going to argue for, your thesis would be the great importance of, of maintaining the integrity and value of the, the fine arts in schools. So one argument would be that music makes people smarter. Now you have a conclusion. You can, so you have your thesis, and now I'm going to ask you to generate three, or you can make as many as you want, but for your final project, I'd like there to be three. Three syllogisms that support that conclusion, that thesis. So you find a conclusion. Music makes you smarter. That's gonna support your thesis. It makes people smarter. So that's, that's gonna support the thesis that, of the value and integrity of, of the liberal arts for schools, right? Well, you got your conclusion. Music makes you smarter. That's an A. Then you go through these 15 valid syllogisms. You find one that ends in A. In this case, there's only one. A, 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 one, Barbara. All M is P, all S is M, therefore all S is P. That's the form of it. Well, you know your predicate term is things that make you smarter. You know your subject term is practice of music. Then everything is there, like I went through that process, but the middle term, you have all, whatever that middle term is, is things that make you smarter, P, minor premise, all music is this M, whatever that is, therefore, all S is P, music makes you smarter, all the practice of music makes you smarter. Then go through that ingenuity moment, it's going to be more than a moment, it may take all day, it may take some time, you have to think about it, and then try to find some connection between the subject and predicate term. Like what happened in class where the student said, well, we just learned that this corpus callosum, whatever stimulates that makes you smart. Then boom, we had our middle term. Now you got your argument, you have an argument. Then all you need to do is translate that into eloquent prose. Don't sound like, you're not gonna say, you know, you're not gonna speak like a all S is P, you know, uh, or all M is P, all S is M, all M is P, all S is M, therefore all S is P. You're not, you're not gonna talk that way. You know, all things that stimulate the corpus callosum make you smarter. Music stimulates the corpus callosum, therefore music makes you smarter. This doesn't sound that stilted, but it still could be made into better prose. So that for that, you need your, to cultivate your, linguistic skills. And the best way to do that is through the study of classical rhetoric. One, that's one way, a good way. Another way is when you read or listen to people, if you hear eloquence, then emulate that, that eloquence. Read with four eyes, one teacher told me. With two eyes, read what's being said or, with, or listen with four ears. You listen with 
to what's being said, but then also listen to how it's being said. Pay attention to style. Or, and you can study the classical rhetoric. But for now, just use whatever linguistic skills you have to translate these syllogisms that you've generated that support your thesis into eloquent prose. So that's the process. Transforming deductive, valid deductive syllogisms into transforming the principles and methods used to distinguish correct from incorrect reasoning, that is the study of logic, transforming those into tools to generate arguments, going from critical thinking to inventive thinking. These are both very important processes. So far in this course, we've been devoting our time to critical thinking. Now in this last part of the course, I wanna focus on inventive thinking. So that, that's how you do it with syllogisms. And next time I'll talk about how you do it with symbolic logic, okay? All right, so that's that. <laughs> and uh, so what I would do for your homework, what I would do is be thinking about a thesis and just try to generate an argument, make a conclusion. It, that conclusion can be an A, an E, an I, or an O. All SSP, no SSP, some SSP, some S is not P. If it's E, then just go through your list. Whatever mood and figure ends in E, like an E-A-E, clararent, uh, um, that's valid, E-A-E-1. So you have, let's say your conclusion is an E proposition, no S is P, whatever you instantiate that. And once you instantiate that, you have everything but the middle term. Or it can end in an I, it can end in an O. So make a con the first step is make a conclusion that support, first make a, a thesis, then make a conclusion that supports your thesis and turn it into an A, E, I, or an O. Then look to the last letter of those 15 valid syllogisms of the moods and find one that corresponds to that, be it an A, an E, an I, or an O. Then find one that is valid, like an E, A, E, one, for example, that ends in E and it's a middle, the middle term is positioned like the beginning of a W that makes it a one, figure one. So the mood of E, A, E and the figure one is valid. So once you have your conclusion, you have everything but the middle term, then you have to use your ingenuity to come up with the middle term. And then you have your syllogism that supports your thesis. See, my thinking is that if you give a speech or if you're thinking and your thinking is the, the skeleton of your thinking is these deductive arguments that are sound, not just valid, but sound. That is all the propositions are true. Like I think that that one that we created about music is sound, you know, because all those things can be proven empirically, empirically. So that it's valid and everything is true. So it's sound. Then once you translate that into eloquent prose, you have something, you have an argument that's valid, that's sound and persuasive. And if you have more than one argument and, and they're all sound, that's gonna be, it's, it'll be very hard for anyone to, uh, the, to uh, dispute your, your talk, your thinking. But the goal is not to win an argument. The goal is to present persuasive speech that leads to what is true and what is right. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, I'm going to grade your homework. I hope you, I just wanted you to memorize the 15 valid syllogisms and the nine um, elementary rules of inference from symbolic logic. I want those in your memory. I want you to have a facility with that. That way you can be more effective 
in uh, generating arguments. Okay, so I'll be hearing from you. Bye.